uh, we're live. I'm going to give it a minute or two to have more attendees come in and then get started. All right. Okay. Yep. We. I think we can start now. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Be Based Wise. I am Shweta Bandapani. I'm the community builder at uh, Be Based Wise. Before we move ahead with the webinar, a quick reminder to everyone, we now have a revamped website. Please go ahead to wastewise.be and uh, you will be able to access all our content over the last 10 years, far easier than it used to be on the previous website. And if there is a topic you would like us to cover or a panelist you would like to hear from, please let us know. You could either drop it in the comments here in, in the chat box or email us at connectedwastewise.be. The topic for today's webinar is waste containerization trends in uh, NYC and beyond. We have uh, Claire Michelin, who's a circular systems thinker and founder of Thinkwoven, along with Diego Barberena, CEO of WasteTech. And Cole Rosengren, lead editor at Waste Dive, is moderating this discussion, and he's put together this panel as well. Uh, Cole has moderated other webinars for us. You will find it in the webinar section of our website. Other than Cole, we've also had Megan from Waste Dive, who's moderated a couple of webinars for us. So as usual, we've received your questions. They've been passed on to the panel. And if you have any additional questions, please use the Q&A box, introduce yourselves in chat, and let's get started. Over to you, Cole. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for joining us and thanks to Be Waste Wise for hosting. So the reason we're doing this webinar is as folks may have seen in the news, New York City is in the, in the midst of a major shift in how it handles its waste, how it thinks about containerization. For anyone who may have visited the city or seen pictures, it's quite well known for the um, sometimes literally mountains of garbage bags, plastic trash bags on the street, on the sidewalk. That's often how things have been done in the city for many years now. Under the current leadership of the city's department of sanitation, they are looking for a new approach. And within the past, I'd say year plus, there have been um, a rapid uh, fire of initiatives here to try to change that, ranging from changing set out times um, and requiring uh, containerization for commercial businesses. And more recently, we're seeing um, the beginnings of a, a new system for residential areas as well. Um, quick disclaimer here, none of us work for the city, none of us can speak for the city, our opinions are our own, we're happy to give you the best knowledge we can, um, and based on the work we've all been doing trying to follow this. So the way we're going to run the session today is um, two initial presentations um, from Claire and then Diego, and then we're happy to take your questions after that. Um, please feel free to put them in the chat as we go, and I'll be keeping an eye on it. So to kick us off, I'm going to turn it to you, Claire, to give a bit of an overview of your work and go a bit more in detail about what you've been seeing in the city, please. Great. Thank you, Cole, and um, Waste Guys. Happy to be here. Um, so I am an architect by background. I lead both um, the nonprofit Center for Zero Waste Design and a consultancy, Think Woven. Um, and since 2017, when I worked on the Zero Waste Design Guidelines, um, um, these were an effort through the American Institute of Architects to really show how design of waste systems in buildings and public space could help New York City reach its zero waste goals. And so back then in 2017, we were already starting to advocate that there were options for waste ca containerization in New York City beyond the roll-off, roll-on containers, which was really the only way, apart from a few front-end loaders, that you could containerize waste. Um, more recently, we've done an advocacy campaign with WXY designers and urban designers and architects, which really looked at three strategies we were. It was an advocacy campaign asking the incoming mayoral administration to take seriously um, the challenge of fixing our waste system and outlining the benefits that could ha happen from it. And it was in three 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 buckets of strategies, like how can we design systems for reuse? So that was called circulate. So we can have systems where you can borrow things, fix things, reusable packaging, take out containers. Then there was a contain section, which was all about how can we get rid of trash bags on our sidewalks and the rats and litter they bring. And then there was a the compost section, which is like, how can we regenerate all the soils in our city with compost that is made from food scraps and, and horticultural waste in the city. 
And the, then it kind of articulated the benefits from improving our streetscapes, from improving jobs, increasingly green jobs, and then healthy, vibrant neighborhoods. Um, so we're really happy that the Department of Sanitation and the mayor are now taking these ideas seriously and are saying we want to containerize all our waste and we're going to do it for organic waste too. I mean, that is such a departure from how it's been for the last 50 years or so where there's just been this inertia about it. So we're really happy about that, but we think there are ways it could be done that it could improve streetscape so much more, be much cheaper, much more effective and help get other goals. So this is just a summary. This slide comes from the um, future of trash report that the Department of Sanitation put out this year, where they are suggesting that for 50% of the residential streets, individual bins can be used. And they just put out um, proposed rules, which would make these mandatory for one to nine units and optional for 10 to 20 units. Um, they've also said commercial waste buildings have to use bins unless they have loading docks. And they've allowed for these bins to be stored on the street. And then they've suggested shared containings, containers for all the mid and high density buildings, 39% of streets, um, but it leaves 11% of streets or 23% of the waste, those biggest piles of garbage bags, which is says are non, not viable for containerization. So, so we think this could be improved. We agree one to two single family homes, yes, use these little bins. But beyond that, um, we have differences. Sorry. You know, there's so many of these low to mid density buildings that have these kind of enclosures outside and the streets are lined with all these bins and it's not very neat. Okay, maybe it's better than bags, but bags are temporary. So we would suggest for this kind of density, especially when we have four streams to collect, you use shared bins um, in the street and we clear the sidewalk of all this clutter. Then, especially when you've got storefronts on the ground floor, there's so many of these streets in New York City with these small storefronts and walk-ups above. At the moment, people have to take their trash straight from their kitchen bin to the street, and it looks like that, and it's awful. But as we see here, the only way to put bins on the sidewalk, they'll block the storefront. And with the re recent rule to do that for commercial waste, we're seeing things like this, bins chained to storm drains, overfull, even when it's done neatly, obstructing storefronts. And if you imagine adding another four to six bins outside for residential waste, we'll have a wall of bins down our commercial corridor, and that is not gonna be good for small businesses or quality of life. So again, this is a perfect place for shared bins in the street, um, not single bins on the sidewalk. And then for large buildings, we think there is a solution for even the biggest buildings. Um, currently, trash normally comes down a chute, recycling often comes down the elevator, it may come down a chute, it's stored in the cellar, and it's brought up typically in a wheeled bin, a wheeled hamper, and then it's taken out of that and piled on the sidewalk. And so you can't get past. Yes, it's a problem, but we don't need shared bins in the street for these big buildings. They have storage space inside. And in many cases, it would take far too much of the street. So we think in that case, we should have the compact, the trash chute can go straight into a 1100 liter, the kind of international style wheel bins. It can be over half the volume, less than half the volume because it compacts so much better if it's going into a bin rather than a bag. And then these can be staged temporarily for collection. So nothing to maintain, no permanent impact on the street. And then for the low to mid density, we have these shared bins, litter bin waste uh, uh, and the residential waste can go in them. And if it's integrated with commercial waste hauling, there can be other sets for the small storefronts to use. So no bags or bins on the sidewalk. It will require some changes in collection. So we've looked at, well, what if you kind of spread the collection of the streams across the week? So you had about a, the same amount on each day. So every day you'd have a different stream collected. It's the same amount of trucks overall. They're just coming on five days rather than three. Um, 
you could then have temporary set out in the street of those wheel bins. And then at another time of day, it could be used for food delivery or parcel delivery or commercial waste. This was part of the AIA New York Delivering the Goods report, where we really looked at how we can make best use of the curb, which is so vital in improving streets in New York City. We've also done work with existing buildings, and we think this um, wheel bin, four wheel bin, could work with an existing building. This is one of the densest um, blocks in the city in terms of um, the 1700 dwelling units setting out their waste on a single block front. Actually, we, we watched pickup. It took um, over 80 minutes to pick up over a thousand bags or bales. Um, one, the gardens actually even use a tractor to bring the waste up. Um, the council member wanted to do shared bins here. So we looked at it and we're like, look, it just doesn't make sense in terms of the labor, in terms of the space, it would use 40% of available curb space, 300 feet permanently occupied. Whereas if we did these staged bins, it's only 117 foot, 15% and it's temporary, less space, temporary, nothing to maintain. Um, and even though it's an old building that used to have an incinerator and has very little space for waste and recycling storage, the additional compaction, the fact that you don't have to store recycling for a whole week means the space requirements are way less and the staging space they already have could work. And these, you have to go with these smaller bins because they fit in elevators. So two cubic yards or anything bigger does not fit in your standard elevator. So going with the smaller bins should work for existing buildings as well. And instead of bringing up in a wheel bin and emptying it out, you bring it up in a wheel bin, which is staged for collection. So that's something we're really pushing. We haven't had traction with the city yet to agree that this is a good idea, but um, we're doing a lot of advocacy around it. So just to summarize our recommendations for containerization is to tie it into zero waste goals. You know, at the same time you're doing this, can you charge buildings by the number of wheel bins of trash they put out? Uh, or give them savings proportion to it because it would have to be saved as you throw. Similarly with commercial waste zoning, you know, add these incentives so people reduce the waste and it's so much easier to do with containers rather than bags. Can you take up less public space? Yeah, it's better to take up the street than the sidewalk, but can we take up less of the street? Because, you know, I was just in Paris actually and I, I love the design of their um, hoist containers for recycling really well integrated into streetscapes. And Paris has an army of people cleaning the streets every day. But even so, whenever you've got shared waste infrastructure in the street, there were instances when there were bags and of trash and cardboard put alongside. So it's a lot of maintenance, anything that is permanently put in the street. So if it can be temporary, that's much better. Um, and so consider working with those buildings to make sure that they have cardboard balers and they can upgrade their compactors to go into bins rather than bags. And then integrate it into the street design. I mean, even wheel bins can be integrated into street design as shown here, even when they're temporary. So yeah, this is just some pics of what it looks in Paris. Here's where I'm showing you people drop stuff off that needs to be cleaned up. Um, and these are temporary four wheel bins staged for collection. This is in London where they do have the shoots to shoot compactors going into the wheel bins. And it's required there that you then have a curb cut and they are I have temporarily staged here in a zone that's also used for loading at a different time of day. And in London, because it's been going for so long, the, the, the truck driver actually has the key, so they will be able to open this key fob, bring it down the curb cut and take it. So there's no need for it to be staged. In New York City, it would have to be staged for a little bit first. Um, so I'm going to put these in the, the chat. I'll put these articles in the chat and these resources. This Vital City article gives a lot of um, context of how we think um, waste should be containerized and summarizes these ideas and then more on the advocacy campaign and, and different. This is a six block study we looked at in Brooklyn, looking at how to containerize the waste. So I'm gonna leave it there and, and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, and thanks to everyone for your questions coming in. Please use the Q&A function and we'll, we're tracking those and we'll get to those after our next 
presentation. Now we're going to turn over to Diego, who's going to talk about um, a specific project he's working on with the New York City Housing Authority in Brooklyn, and also share some other um, thoughts on shared containerization. Over to you, Diego. I think you may be muted. Yes. Second. So my name is Diego Barberena. I'm uh, similar to Claire. I also come from the architecture side. And during the pandemic, I was, we were all in New York confronted by this huge amount of trash. Um, in my, my opinion, what happened is that people stopped going to work and they went home and started ordering everything on Amazon and the residential trash just increased exponentially. So sanitation department, it's usual, usual load of or, or waste flow increase and they were outrun. So um, the company is the mission is to reduce the impact of human waste on the environment through smart and efficient waste management technologies. If you walk around New York, everything until now it's a rear loader, everything is done by hand and that's not the way it's been done in Europe. And uh, that's expensive and it it's actually dangerous too. Um, so what is the solution? The solution for me is uh, more high capacity containers. It can be underground, it can be uh, not underground. In the question somebody asked, what about using compacting systems? Uh, you see here at the right, there's like a little column. That's an underground compactor, so that can be done. It's more involved, but in a new development, it can certainly be done. So I will, what are our goals? Our goals are to reduce the waste economic impact, reduce waste ecological impact, reduce waste health impact, reduce waste visual impact, and improve waste services. So what we're saying is that we can do this better for the same amount of money or even less. Uh, reducing the economic impact. If you have sensors, you only need to go and collect the trash when the container is full, right? So you don't need to be going around the city collecting half, uh, half full beans. At the same time, if a bean is getting full, you can go and collect it before it overflows. Uh, so high capacity reduce the frequency of pickups, reducing the cost of mass and time travel, reducing labor and equipment use. Uh, same mathematic technology can reduce labor by half because you don't now you don't need two people picking up the, the waste. It can be one. I mean, New York City currently you want to use two people. Um, when they start, they see this as a pilot, so one of them is going to be operating the truck, and the other one is going to be there for safety. Uh, reduce ecological impact. So one of the chats also said how 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 the waste is separated in New York and it's actually for stream, but it's not much more efficient. Uh, in Germany, they separate glass in three streams. They separate clear glass, amber glass, and green glass. And this is possible because once you have one of these systems, this is an underground system, you can have as many containers as you want and many streams as you want. And reduce health impact. This is again how easy it is to access these underground containers reduce mass travels, closed containers keep rats away, closed containers keep dangerous garbage away from pedestrians and sanitation employees, and mechanize lift project sanitation employees from physical stress and trauma of carrying the bags and hurting their back. And reduce the visual impact, right? I, I think we can all live with this. It's, I think it's fine. And this is what we currently have in New York, which we don't want. If you have smart bins, you have no trash days. So this is how it's done in Europe. Uh, there's two main systems for uh, shared containers, uh, which Claire showed. One is the side loaders. So side loaders are these shared containers. Let's go, drop your trash. 
they can have restricted access, which we don't recommend because it's more expensive. The title is important, so some of these are low, so you can see the cars when you cross the street. And they pick up in no time. You see the difference from this and a dumpster is that where you put the trash is a small entrance and then the cover office in the back to low, um, to let the trash get out. This is more in detail, the, the side loader truck. And if you see, it's similar to what is being used currently in the suburbs, just that the suburbs side loaders are just for these small wheel bins which work well for this scale, but it will not work like in a city. And it's the same mechanism. So it can be picked up in 32 seconds. Another system that is being used in Europe is this bilateral above ground containers. And this is actually what we're using right now at NYCHA. NYCHA has a, we want a pilot project uh, for Brooklyn, um, and these are the containers that we're gonna use, and we're gonna have two of these trucks uh, picking up the waste. It's pretty automatic. You just go with the joystick, you select the container you wanna pick up. This is the same shared containers, you can open them, they can be restricted or they cannot be restricted. Uh, and Coney Island project, we are not going to restrict them, so anyone can use them. They're not supposed to be used for, uh, by commercial uh, establishments, but NYCHA knows that small businesses do go and dump their trash in uh, NYCHA properties. So how are they going to handle it? Are they going to police it or not? Um, we don't know. What is different of these containers, if you see it empties from the bottom, which is pretty good because there's no accumulation of waste in the bottom part. So the bottom opens and everything comes down. And you can pick a container in a minute and a half. This is real time, so it's not that slow. Uh, as Claire said, above ground containers do have the challenge that if you have a lot of them in an area, they're always there. So I don't know if people are gonna be happy with that. Uh, but that's why we have the pilot project. And you're done. A not advanced system using the same uh, equipment is uh, <clears throat> underground. So these are actually, you can see in Europe in, um, in nicer areas, in downtowns, like downtown Zurich, they have them, uh, they have them in the tourist areas. And no one complains because, I mean, it's just a small trash can, but it actually has the capacity of six cubic yards. Uh, it comes from the ground, but you see it has this platform that comes up, so there's no one can fall into the hole. And you can pick from two sides, which is the difference from the uh, side loaders. Side loaders, you can only pick from one side. So that's a challenge because you need to, you need to plan the, how you're gonna pick them up. Are you gonna pick them up from the left? Are you gonna pick them up from the right? If you pick them up from the right, which is what is usually done, that's usually where the boss routes are in New York. So that's a problem. With bilateral, you don't have that problem. You just pick from both sides. So 
our proposal, uh, we share goes more into the details of how to implement them. We, we go more of the tools of what tools we can provide to implement them and uh, follow Claire's or somebody else's recommendations. And one is having a sensor, the sensor will tell you what stream and what capacity this is. And if you can see the colors, it goes from red to green. So you pick the red first and the orange. <clears throat> one, 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 there's different scales of trash, right? So we have this corner beans. The corner beans are usually over full. Uh, they get blown away and they go directly to, to the sewage, which goes directly to the water, which is what we don't want. Uh, the city has been implementing these big bellies. The problem with the big bellies is they have smaller capacity than the newer ones that have will be in containers. So there's a lot of them. One cube is one of them, and then there's many others. The big belly have no wheel bins, so the person that is servicing them, they needs to go down and pull them. And I think they are they were good in their time, but I think they're becoming obsolescent. Once you have these wheel bins, uh, you can have these uh, lifters, which is actually what the New York City is just implementing. Like uh, I think they started uh, last month. And I have I never seen one of them being used in the city. You see them in Europe all over the place because this is the most basic system. And these lifters will also help fill these containers that Claire said, the 1,100 liters, which are used in Europe all over the place. And following what Claire says, uh, we have we also offer these systems that work with the bilateral. You can have them in the back of the house and you can roll them into an elevator. They're between around two cubic yards, which is what Claire recommended to. If you do more, they become too heavy, they become too big, and it's hard to move. And provide shared containers. So on the left is the side loaders that we saw in the first video, and on the right is uh, the ones we're gonna use in Coney Island, which are the bilateral ones. Uh, the ones on the left are in Spain, the ones on the right are in Italy. The photograph and uh, change uh, the equipment, right? So on the left, we have the side loaders, which again, you can only do from one side and on the right, we have the bilateral. The bilateral, you can feel from both sides. Then each system has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the bilateral is a more complex system, can carry more equipment and the truck is, it's a bigger truck, it's a heavier truck and it's more demanding. The bilateral is a cheaper system uh, it's more constrained, but that's why the SNY is selected because I think it's cheaper and it's easy to implement. Uh, so that's all from my side. Great. Well, thank you very much, Diego, for showing us all that. And I think both presentations are very helpful to have the visualization is a very visual topic. And I know it's elicited a lot of um, thoughts in the chat so far. So keep those coming. We're now going to do a quick um, poll of the audience to see what what um containerization options are being used where you live in your area so we're going to tee that up with um some visual prompts you should be seeing that coming up on your screen feel free to take a minute or two to look at that and respond to that and while you're doing so i'm going to give just some quick thoughts to some of the um the questions in the chat and diego and claire please feel free to jump in if you want to expand on anything i'm saying so one question was just about how waste is segregated in new york so for residential, the common breakdown is there's a trash or refuse stream. There's um, a stream for metal, glass, and plastic. There's another stream for um, paper slash fiber. And soon throughout the five boroughs, um, all residents will have access to organics collection as well for food waste. Right now, yard waste is already collected seasonally, but by about this time next year, everyone in all five boroughs will have access to food waste collection. So that's the answer on that. Um, there's another question about diversion rates. Last I checked, uh, city uh, DSNY's diversion rate was around 18% for residential. And just it's every city manages it differently, but just so folks know, in New York, um, all residential, including the very large multifamily buildings, are handled by the city collection service. So that number encompasses all residential, including multifamily. Uh, let's see. Another question we had was just about volume overall. According to a report that the city put out in the spring for containerization, they estimate 
about 44 million pounds per day of waste is generated in New York. This includes commercial and residential. Commercial accounts for slightly more than half of that volume. Um, those are some quick answers. Thank you for uh, engaging on the poll. We will return to that in a minute. I'm gonna turn to some broader discussion here and then we'll keep um, watching things in the chat. One thing both presentations touched on a little bit, it's a big piece of why the city's pushing this is the rat piece, right? Rodent mitigation, that's been a big rationale by the the, the mayor in New York for why they're doing this. Um, kick it to you, Claire and then Diego, if you have any thoughts. Is Does that change at all how to approach this if that's kind of the main goal? Does that change how you would think about containerization at all? Um, I would say not really. I mean, container bags on the street, of course, are really <laughs> easy for rats to get into. So any containerization ho helps things a lot. I mean, I would say that the, the international style, like the 1100 liters have better lids. So the pilot that Department of Sanitation have done up in Harlem with the the, the three cubic yard wheeled um, dumpsters, their lids don't seal so well. So, I mean, they're still a lot harder for rats to get into than bags, but but in general, I'd say no. Part uh, Reducing rats was always part of our idea of the benefits of containerization. So just that particular focus um, hasn't changed. I would say that the other focuses need to be taken into account because if you just focus on rats, it's a bit um, narrow, the vision, and our focus is on how containerization can reduce waste, how it can, how you can do it to in, uh, improve public space. Um, bins rather than bags may reduce rats, but if they're piled on the sidewalk, they don't help um, give space for pedestrians. So the narrow yeah. focus maybe has meant that some of the other benefits are not being realized. Thank you. That makes sense. We had another a uh, thought just come in from the chat, which we'll look at in a moment. Um, oh, so here are the results of our poll. Thank you, Sweater, for putting this up. So it seems like two-wheeled bins, which makes sense, depending on where you live in the U.S., that is fairly common that you're going to have that in um, in your area, especially more residential areas. But this is useful to see this breakdown. Underground containers, of course, being less, less common in the U.S. in most areas for now. Um, Thank you everyone for participating in this. We'll, we'll pull this together so we can post this with the video, perhaps the results of this, which I think will be useful. Um, back to the rat piece, Kendall here is mentioning, right? We've we've heard of, you know, rats or raccoons or others find, find a way into the bin. Does that, Diego, when you're working on the shared bin concept, for example, is that a consideration in terms of durability or access through the top for animals? Is that something that your clients are asking about? As they did, and that's an important thing for them. So I think one of the reasons that we won is because our our lead closed much better than the competition. The competition had a bigger gap. We still have a, a rubber a rubber element that closes to zero, to be virtually zero, but of course it's rubber, right? So there's like a gap of half an inch, which if the rubber piece wouldn't be there, I mean, you can get rats into it. But I think our containers is pretty tight. Got it. Okay, that's helpful. Um, another question. We'll just run through the audience questions here to make sure everyone's getting addressed. Um, question about theft of carts. And so, for context here, you know, the what's being proposed in the city is that um, residential units uh, or buildings with one to nine units will so uh, soon be required to purchase carts. Details are being worked out on that. It won't be finalized for a couple of years, but the idea is that. The, the building owner or the tenant will be responsible, not it won't be provided by the city, which is the case in some areas. Um, and the question is about theft. I don't know, Claire, Diego, if you've seen any research on this or seen this come up, are there theft concerns for these smaller carts in other cities? Well, I think in most cities, it's the case that the city purchases them. And that's what we see as much more common. And then often it's tied in with um, pay as you throw. No, isn't that what you what you see you, you you probably know a lot more than either of us on this call <laughs> sure yeah no i think you're right and that's that's true right if the for example yeah most cities are where i live for example in Ma up in massachusetts the city provides the cart 
to the resident. And so if your cart gets lost or damaged, you can request a new one, usually at no cost to you. So it's, a, it's an in interesting question, you know, where in, under this scenario where the residents will be the ones who have to pay for the carts, how will that work? And I don't, it, we've, having looked at the bid specs for what the city is looking for in these carts, I don't, we're not, they're not looking at RFID tags for tracking, you know, that's an added cost. And the goal of this seems to be to have a low cost option. So I think it's a real question, something we'll have to look at. And I would um, say when the city publishes uh, the rules around this that are going to dictate how this works, maybe we'll see something in there about theft or, you know, recourse for theft. So I think it's a good question. Um, another question about compression. I know, Claire, you, you uh, seem to tackle this a bit in the chat, but does anyone have further thoughts on Compression technology, where it's a fit, where it's not a fit, I would imagine in some cases it just comes down to cost and weight, right? You wouldn't necessarily have compactors or compression technology and everything on a shared bin on the street, for example, right? I mean, I think they do uh, exist, have... but yeah, Diego, go ahead. Sorry, for the underground systems, they do exist. It's, it's much more expensive. Uh, it, it's over $30,000 for a compactor underground, but you can take... Uh, like four times the trash of uh, one regular uh, underground container. So instead of being six cubic yards, you can have them to 24 cubic yards. And this is being used in Europe a lot, but they are more expensive. And this, uh, yeah, it all comes to cost. We can also have these underground uh, containers or compactors that we show you with the system. It's in uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to implement. So. It is, it, it, it is a challenge, but I think that's possibly the solution for a New York City downtown where they don't have the space to mm -hmm. put all this uh, waste. Yeah, I would, I mean, I was talking about compression within buildings. I mean, it's code that you have to have a, a, a trash compactor over five stories, nine units. Um, so that's already in building code, every big building. Um, well, not every, some of the Upper West Side ones that don't have chutes, don't have trash compactors, but the vast majority of large buildings have trash compactors. And as I said, those could be converted into compacting into wheel bins. And they would think now they're about 1.6 to one, they could get to four to one. So vastly reduced volume. And cardboard balers, we're seeing more and more of those as well. But the problem is with the cardboard balers at the moment, you have to make these tiny bales because they're lifted by hand. So that kind of integration of how the Department of Sanitation collect waste and what can be done in buildings is 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 essential to do together. Even the 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 new bins that have to be um, provided, um, they're pretty small size still. Whereas you want you don't want to have a lift for a twenty one gallon organics bin the guys are going to be like, it would be quicker for me to throw that in myself. And I think they piloted it years ago. And that was the, that was the upshot of it, that the, the workers were like, we don't want to wait around for this little arm to lift a 13 or 21 gallon bin. It has to be larger bins when you have those lifts for larger buildings. So I think that integration between what happens in the building and how it's, collected is just so important to do to do right mm -hmm. i'm glad you mentioned the worker piece we had a previously submitted question excuse me about that this week um any other thoughts from either of you about how, how to consider the role the role of collection workers in this right on the one hand containerization should you know be safer right if they're not exposed to uh needles broken glass hazardous chemicals that may come out of the bags but on the other hand it can slow things down potentially as you say if they're having to you know use the the lift for smaller items do we feel like that has been adequate adequately considered so far in new york or any other things that you all want to call out about how to think about the collection workers in this um i think it's a huge piece i mean new york city um collection workers are lifting over like five tons in a day the injuries are huge back injuries i think are the biggest one and the workman's comp is really expensive for them um and a huge cost for the city. Um, so I think the worker piece, piece is, is huge. And I think it's undeniably better to be containerized. And we're not just talking about the, the hauler workers, the, the workers in buildings. I mean, they're to, to take those 
sausage bags out of the compact then you have to kind of break up that slug of trash you have to tie it you have to lift them they're having back breaking work too and the needles and the broken glass and then they're lifting it into hampers normally hampers not tilt trucks which are more ergonomic because but they take more space so that putting it into the hamper then they're taking it out i think that that it would be vastly better for workers to have it containerized and i would disagree that it slows it down if it's done right if the containers are the right size and i've watched uh, in many countries um them being collected when and trucks are getting better and better to go faster and faster the lifts to be quicker and, and and do a better job and whenever i have asked to video people i always say because i work in new york and we have bags and the overwhelming response is like is that allowed by health and safety rules there um, workers in other countries are amazed that bags are still being used in New York City. Interesting. Um, Diego, anything you'd want to call out on how the worker safety piece, what, how that's being considered in the Nitro Pilot, for example? Yeah, it is being considered. One of the problems that they have in NYCHA is that they don't follow the rules. So these sausages need to be small for people to handle them, but it's faster to make big sausages. So they will do two people to handle them. So that's an issue. I mean, they have to carry up into this container, which is not designed for that, right? So we gave them an option that they can have a, a roll bin that has a, an elevator, or like it lifts itself, so to fill it. But yeah, and and I agree with Claire. This is done correctly. It 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 actually should be twice as fast, like twice as fast. Like currently, it takes one whole day for. The sanitation department to to fill a truck is around six hours, I think, what it is, and then they go back to the terminal, and they do whatever they need to do, and they finish their hours seven or eight. Uh, but we think that with this distance, you can fill a truck in three hours, two or three hours. So we think we it, it is a big improvement. Also, if you're using the systems, well, your back doesn't hurt, so you can keep doing this after you're fifty or. 60 years old while if you've been working in sanitation more than 20 years I think by then your back is destroyed and you don't want to be doing this anymore I mean you go to another job so so yeah it is important and I think this is a big improvement for them gotcha thank you those thoughts are helpful um Turning back to the Q&A, quick a question, share of bio waste and residential waste in New York. I haven't looked at the latest waste characterization studies, but I, it's on average 30%, if I recall. Yeah, it's about, a, it's about a third. The latest waste characterization study hasn't come out yet. I'm not sure why we're still, right, it's been a while. still doing the 2017 one. I, I think they've done it. I don't know why it's not been published. Um, mm. But they did actually, in this latest one, um, look at the volume um, to mass ratio. So the density mm. ratios, which would be really helpful because I think it's about a third of weight, but in terms of volume, it's more like, by my calculations, like 17% of the volume, depending how much of the lightweight compostables and leaves versus the heavyweight food waste. It would be really helpful to know. Okay, that's good to know. We'll keep an eye out for those new numbers. Um, another question about bulk waste and where that fits into containerization. I would imagine not well, right? It's... Um, Furniture and other items are not going to work great with these systems, but what, what do you all think about that? Um, the yeah. only ones they can work with, and we're doing some stuff for nature, is putting them into the auger roll-off compactors where you can put furniture into those systems as well as trash, um, but that's a big roll-off container. Every other city, no. I mean, Paris has places where you can drop it off. You know, Zurich has trams that go around. You put your furniture in this. There's normally supplementary systems for bulk waste. And hopefully you can, um, the good thing about setting it out is a lot of it can be, there's a lot of people who, myself included, pick up stuff you see on the street. But um, doing that in a way, I know in Seattle, they have a Fridays every month where people set out bulk. So then you know a bit more where you can go and shop for furniture on the street. So I think integrating that in a good way so that it didn't, Proves to reuse is important too. That's good to know. Okay. Um, I know there's a couple, it's been a recurring theme in the questions, but we'll hit it one more time about waste volumes, right? I know, Claire, you mentioned in your presentation, you would like to see this integrated with the save as you throw or pay as you throw system to incentivize some reduction in volumes. What we've heard 
from the city when that question has been raised is that they, for various reasons, you know, consider it uh, challenging to implement save as you throw. And in part because of that, they want to play in the system for the waste volumes that exist. That is their reasoning, not our opinion. Um, but any other thoughts about how to think about this long term, if this is going to be a long term system that's you know put in place for decades, is there a way to scale it up or scale it down? Or are they kind of locking in on a certain volume expectation here? That's that's my worry. I mean, the pilot in Harlem, I don't know if people have seen it, but um, on one block, there are 19 of those three cubic yard containers just for trash. And the rationale was that we're sizing it for 150% of the current volume of trash. To me, that's that's not thinking that we can improve things. I mean, that's <laughs> that's not the way forward. I understand the worry that there will be stuff left alongside but at the moment the whole system we collect um, trash three times a week and recycling once it's actually a penalty because I consult with a lot of buildings and I, I do the space requirements and I'm like look if your people don't recycle well your trash room's big enough but if they recycle well you need a bigger trash room because you have to store a whole week's worth of recycling and a few days of trash in there and we should be incentivizing um people doing the right thing so I think it's really important we just don't say we have to collect 150 percent of this the bad recycling rate we have now because um, it's locking that in and then if you provide those kind of containers and you only provide a small amount for recycling what's going to happen people will just put it in the trash and it, it, you know yeah and it's too much public space and if it's done wrong you risk losing public um support for these things Diego any other, anything you'd want to add on that kind of thinking about this volume question no, I, I agree with chair um, and we don't want to see trash right we want to just throw it away and forget about it so the city has to I mean hopefully you can reduce the waste and uh, going back to these bulk things uh, I mean everybody in New York City is a very transit city where people come here after college or grad school and they spend some years, um, they work in a big office uh, and then they go, right? And when they go, they have all this furniture that they just bought, which is usually in good condition. And when they want to donate it, if you call the Salvation Army, they won't pick it up. And then you have to, what if you have no car, are you going to haul it where, right? So nobody wants to take it, so then you put it in the trash. So the city had a system of better donation that you can donate things or take it to one of these uh, empty storefronts, uh, there will be less trash because all this furniture wouldn't go to the sidewalk. If the furniture is on the sidewalk, many people will not take it just because they are afraid now that it's going to have bed bugs or stuff like that, mm -hmm. especially like in big elements like sofas. Uh, there's, uh, for example, all these mattresses, right? There's recycling a mattress is complicated, but there's people that do it and they do it well. Uh, yeah, and not just doing mattress recycling in many of its developments, actually. Yeah, no, and mattress recycling has really taken off up here in the Northeast. You know, um, here in Massachusetts, there's a, a disposal ban on mattresses. Um, and so there's a lot of um, growth in the mattress recycling area. I think we'll see more of that in the future. Um, a couple other questions in the Q&A sort of building off what we just talked about, you know, does, could this at all lead to um, changes in collection frequency, depending on, and it's even setting aside the volume question, right, if the containerization kind of allows for that. Any thoughts on that, Claire? I think it's essential. I mean, as I said, it reduces uh, space in buildings um, and collection frequency needs to be more mapped to, to density. At the moment, there's some parts of my neighborhood that get, that it's one family blocks and they get three times a week collection. The same is happening in the financial district with thousands of units on a block, three times a week collection. Um, collection should be more um, proportional to density, higher and higher density areas. And then it should be balanced across the week. So you're not so it's efficiency of storage space in buildings, and then it's efficiency of the use of the street space as well. 
um, whether I think the question is, is New York City ready for it? I can't answer for the city, but I think it's kind of essential to optimize containerization. Gotcha. Um, another one on those uh, lines. Oh, sorry, please. Let me add. Uh, the Sensoneo, the, the system that we're using, the European system for sensors, they have an app that is on demand. You can ask them to to collect when you want it. So, for example, if you're a big building and you have one container and there's like a space, as Claire said, where you can put trash, you can take it out and say, speak it up. And if there's like, I mean, in neighborhoods, let's assume the upper side where I live, I'm sure there will be one truck for every stream collecting every day, right? So with five trucks, you can collect the entire city. You said, I want my beam to be collected, like a two cubic yard. And then you just take it out and collect it. And that, I mean, that's that's an idea. It's a little complicated and I know it's not gonna be done, but the technology is there to do it, so. Yeah, I would respond to that, that I think sensors only make sense for large, very large containers, like roll off containers, where it's like a single trip, where obviously it's, you wanna know if it's full, but residential waste in New York City is pretty standard and you're not gonna, you can optimize the routes without, you're not gonna vary them day to day. There's not a big advantage of that. You 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 should optimize the routes and 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 um change that slightly over time, but not on a this building has more bins right now, um, differential sensors. I think it's too it's too large a system for that. Interesting. We'll see how that all evolves. Um, another question that I think I can just take quickly, question about how to separate plastic waste from organics. If I'm understanding this correctly, maybe this is referring to plastic contamination in the organic stream, if it is, and please tell me if I get this wrong, whoever just asked the question, um, nor, at least for the material collected by DSNY, and I believe on the commercial side too, just about all the organics are going through pre-processing now before they end up at their final destination, whether that's um, a compost site or a digester. So that's a big concern that we're seeing, not just in New York, but around the, around the country. And that seems to be kind of where things are heading in terms of microplastics, compostable packaging. A lot of that's getting filtered out and that's baked into the system now. Um, yeah, I would say the only ones are the drop-offs. So the drop-off um, food scraps in uh, farmers markets and you know uh, the grow and my seed drop-offs that go to the community composters, they don't allow plastics and they produce a much better quality compost. So. I think we need both systems personally, but you're right. The DSMY has the tiger machines, which pull out the plastics at both Newtown Creek and at uh, the municipal composting sites. Yeah, no, that's a good point about the drop-off being different. Um, another question here sort of relates to other stuff we've seen in the chat about effectively communicating this shift to residents, you know, how it's going to be a big change in terms of, uh, you know, A, we've already started to see it with businesses this summer, it's been a change for them, but it's really gonna hit the population in the next couple of years whenever we, every residential home has to have one of these. Um, any thoughts from either of you on how this kind of messaging and education piece can be handled? I mean, I think it, it's very important that it is done well and there wasn't a lot of outreach or any kind of engagement with the city so far on these changes. They were just kind of sprung upon people. I think there also wasn't thought about what happens in buildings, what happens on the street. So for example, in the Harlem pilot, they've added these trash um, dumpsters in the street, but these are actually, I think the most difficult type of buildings to containerize because they're kind of the 20, 30 units. They have maybe a part-time super. Often they have centralized bins out front or maybe in the cellar. So, now the residents are putting stuff in the bins and then those bins may be lining the sidewalk and then the super's taking it from the bin across the street. I was talking to the super, I said, why don't you make the residents put it straight in the bin? He was concerned about if he did that, then there would be contamination issues because people would just see recycling bins there, would say, where have the trash bins gone? And would they be wanting to take, or another building, the the recycling bins would then stay in the cellar and then they'd take the trash to the street. And then, you know, the cellar's not very nice. People are just going to put their recycling in the trash. So I think thinking of the mindset of the people and the building workers, you have to engage them and how these solutions are going to work. You can't just 
look at what's in the street and say, oh, that about the volume of trash, let's put it in a container and see how it works. I think there's, yeah, there's got to be a lot more engagement with building managers and then they can educate the residents if it that especially if there's incentive incentivization we saw that um like in toronto they did a save as you throw and um there were buildings there that have gone from using the shoot for trash to using it for organics because their organic system takes everything even diapers um but some of those buildings did that because they got all these benefits as a as a building in terms of reduced costs. So it was worth the building managers making sure they optimized their system for diversion so they could reap the benefits. And then the building managers are doing the education of the tenants. So I think there's a lot of places where you can pass that along. It's not like the city has to ed educate all eight and a half million people individually. Thank you for those thoughts. Um, Diego, anything you want to add on the education piece? How you think about that at the NYCHA pilot? Well, in the NYCHA pilot, um, I mean, they try, they are trying to educate their people all the time. They go to extreme methods to put ads in their um, elevator lobby saying, don't throw the trash through the window, <laughs> which it will seem obvious to everyone. Um, but apparently there's like these maybe 1% of NYCHA residents that they really don't care. So there's always going to be a challenge, right? But I think most of the people want to do the right thing. But also most of the people will not go to a big effort to do the right thing, right? So for example, uh, plastic bags, recycling, we pass this law that the supermarkets need to take them. During COVID, they stopped in taking them. And now in my area, there's like no place to take them, right? So you cannot recycle plastic bags because nobody's going to take them unless you what put them in a cabinet and then store them and then drive them somewhere, which is kind of not easy, right? So people just put them in the trash. Uh, well, these uh, uh, composting bins, People use them a lot, which more, much more than I thought, uh, and the way that I know it's because they get full. But on Sundays they get full, right? So people just leave them on the side. And so people want to do the right thing, but they're not going to take the compost back to their home. So my wife told me, what should I do? It's like, should I bring it home? Should I put it on top of the garbage bin or should I put it in the, in the, in the, in the corner bin, right? Uh, the only right solution would be bring it by phone, but that's that's a big ask to tell people, right? The, the other two options are against the rules. So people want to do the right thing, but it has to be easy. That's that's my point. Fair. No, that's what makes this all so complicated. Um, well, we're just about up at time. I, we won't be able to get through all the questions. I will put my email in the chat, though, and I'm happy. Feel free, folks, to email me. If anyone knows me, I will just about always respond to an email. So whatever question is, send it my way, um, and I'll do my best. Before we wrap, though, I want to just kick, um, kick it back to both Claire and Diego once more. Anything else you want to get out there? Anything that folks should be watching for in, say, the next six months to a year on this topic? I'll start with you, Claire. Um. I mean, I think there's going to be a lot happening because the, the rollout has been without stakeholder engagement. And I think because it's not improving our streetscapes for now, I think there is going to be more pushback from organizations in the city to, to, to try and make sure containerization is done right. So I'm hoping, I mean, I'm hoping that the push that came from the mayor and the administration to, for, to do it quickly I mean, I think their push was like, let's do it quickly. So let's not get stakeholder engagement. I hope they can modify that a little bit and realize that, yes, it's important to have the momentum to do things quickly, but not if it doesn't make it work right. And hopefully they can adjust their approach a little bit to do it well. Um, that's my hope. <laughs> well, thank you. And what about you, Diego? Any parting thoughts? Well, I think it's, uh, the next year is a very important year. Uh, if you see where we were, like in the beginning of the year, there was no waste study, there was no uh, uh, lifters in the in the rear loaders, there's no side loaders, there's no bilateral loaders, and by the end of next year, we'll have everything. We'll have 
the lifters, which are already starting now. We'll have the NYCHA project with the bilateral, and we are pretty sure that DSMY will have a, a side loader. So it not may not be seen, but the technology is going to be out there. And also, starting next year, I think in October, composting, separating compost, it's the rule. It's not optional. Now it's optional, but it's going to be the rule. So all these rules uh, that some people have been ignoring, they're going to come to affect everyone, right? And what happened with this, uh, the waste bins that the city just put laws, which cost them nothing, according to them, or maybe that's what they thought. Uh, but these uh, wheel bins, according to the rules currently, they have to be very small, like 40, 40 gallons and stuff like that. And they don't fit anything. So people are using 65 gallons, 96 gallons. And the only way of managing them are with lifters. And if you have five trucks with lifters out of 2000, that's not going to work. So, I mean, we're going to see big changes because they're pushing and uh, they have, we all have to, to do our part, right? Sanitation has to do our part, uh, residents have to do our part, and suppliers have to do our part, and Claire with the advocacy has. I mean, she has all these ideas, and um, I think many of them will be implemented. Yeah, no, it's going to be quite interesting to watch all of this in the next um, few years ahead. Well, thank you again to Claire and Diego for joining us. Thanks, everyone else, for, for watching and participating. And back to you, Sueta, for any final thoughts here. Thank you, Cole. Thank you, Claire. And thank you, Diego. Uh, just to the audience, uh, I'm sure you can find the speakers on LinkedIn, please go ahead and you can follow their posts. And you also they drop links to their website. So you will have more information there. And in case uh, there are some other questions that have to be responded to, uh, we will try to share it with the panelists and whatever response we get, we will add it when it goes up on our website. So thanks everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Carl.